Hello everyone and welcome to another episode of Autism Stories. I'm your host Doug Bletcher, the founder of Autism Personal Coach. Autistic people are the true experts of the autistic experience and Autism Stories is where we interview autistic people to learn from their stories, experiences, and get their advice. If you would like to be notified about each week's episode of Autism Stories, we suggest you subscribe on your favorite podcast listening platform. We would also appreciate it if you could give us a positive rating and review as it would help others to learn about autism stories. Something that can be really frustrating is when businesses and nonprofits use words like neurodiversity and autism in their marketing campaigns, but don't really have an understanding of what these words truly mean. That's why I'm pleased to talk with Jude Morrow on this episode of, of Autism Stories to discuss businesses that are truly supporting autistic and neurodivergent minds, changing careers from a social worker to a CEO, and to discuss the New York City Autism Tech Innovation and Career Expo, in which he will be a keynote speaker for this event in May. We hope you enjoy today's conversation. Jude, thanks so much for joining me today. Oh, and no, thank you for having me here. I've been looking forward to this for the last couple of weeks to get catching up. Absolutely. And just kind of starting out, um, where I usually start with all these episodes of Autism Stories, where does your story begin in the autistic community? Well, my story in the autistic community started on the 7th of August, 1990, at 10 past 4 in the afternoon, which is literally the day and hour that I was born. So that's where, it, I suppose, it started. And, I mean, for me, I grew up in Irish Catholic moderately conservative Ireland back in the mid 90s and I was among the first autistic children in the UK and Ireland the first kind of wave to go through the mainstream school system and I suppose it was very early on in life like very many of us where I learned quite early on and started to feel that I was quite socially unacceptable compared to everybody else that's how I felt I lived a life of cats Jude can't socialize properly, Jude can't play properly, Jude can't do this, Jude can't do that. And it sort of sowed the seeds for a very nervous, anxious, masky, introverted 12-year-old that pretty much lasted right up until I was about 25. Because it's although every autistic person is completely different, I suppose the way we're viewed and treated by a lot of people is very much the same. A lot of people with their hearts in the right place trying to fix us, help us fit in. And my experience matches pretty much that and after that after school I went to college and I set myself a life goal and it was a pretty toxic one when I was about 16. I thought I'm going to do everything I possibly can in my power to hide who I truly am and go the opposite of what my natural order is and in keeping that theme keeping that brand I became a social worker because I thought oh I can't work with people I'm not a sociable person <laughs> I'll show you and I did. And that was a job I did for eight years where I worked in loads of different fields, mental health, fostering and adoption, and a little bit of CPS work as well. And normally whenever I do mention that live in any live shows, I get some booze, some like comedy booze, like boo, CPS guy. So I did that for a while. And then my son was born. I know. Yeah, we can grow up and have kids and families and stuff. And I'm an autistic dad to a neurotypical son. And... It led my son, Ethan, to ask my mother, his grandmother, why does daddy always look so sad? And I wasn't sad because I was autistic. I was sad because I didn't really accept myself for who I was and had become so tired, pretty much putting on another character. And then I wrote the, my experience down in the book of the same title. And it circumnavigated the globe, and I didn't expect it to. I always wanted to write a book. And it came out, went around the world, was picked up by Beyond Words. They're the publisher of The Secret. They published my books. Published this one and the most recent one, Loving Your Place in the Spectrum, which was out last month. And I suppose it was a little bucket list thing, writing a book, but then it got out of hand, where I started giving talks in schools, corporates, workplaces. And I'd already kind of had my hand in business and investment, even before kind of writing books. 
and now it has kind of grown and scaled to be what, what Neurodiversity Training International is now, and it's been really, really fun, right? And I get to meet and talk to my tribe and cool people like you, so it's wonderful. Hmm. Best thing ever. Now, now you, you mentioned um, Neurodiversity Training International. You're the CEO, and you know it's it's a really interesting business to me because I don't know if I've seen a business like yours out there that guides autism-based businesses and nonprofit and nonprofits to prominence in the neurodiversity marketplace. Can you maybe just talk a little bit about what you do and what makes Neurodiversity Training International so unique? I mean, with Neurodiversity Training International, it's had like a, a couple of kind of evolutions to get to the point where it is now. And the reason why I wasn't a confident teenager or young man is because the way autism and any kind of neurodivergent way of being is marketed so negatively. So I thought, why don't we turn that on its head where everything, every marketing strategy and system and tactic that, you know, that we instill upon our clients is based upon the wishes, wants, feelings of the neurodivergent community as a whole. And it is working with companies to adopt identity first language, to drop, you know, blue puzzle pieces and all of these things, and to basically have a brand and service that has the most impact with the autistic and neurodivergent communities that they serve, whilst adhering to the preferences of the neurodivergent community as well, of which I'm very proudly a part of, as are the rest of the team. So that's kind of, that's what we do. And we do lots of different cool things, like we do like course design, marketing, branding, graphic design, we're even making a comic strip with a client at the minute, and that is the most fun I've ever had without alcohol, <laughs> and I love it to death. And uh, that that says a lot. Being Irish, it really does. And I mean, it's it's become really really fun for me because a lot of the way autism and neurodiversity as a whole has been marketed is by kind of generic marketing companies that focus on fear and deficit. You know, buy our thing and your child will get better. We call that autism racketeering. Because, you know, like the old mob tactic, like say, Doug, you owned, you owned a little shop and I came into your shop and said, there's a gang down the street that want to burn your shop down, but if you give us money, we'll stop them burning your shop down. But if you don't pay me, what am I going to do? I'm going to burn your shop down. So we wanted to turn that on its head to celebrate gifts, passions, talents, and everything else. And whenever we find that our clients do that, they attract more customers, gain more membership, higher SEO, and generally good favor. So that's, I suppose, the most compressed kind of version of MTI that I can possibly give. So this certainly, I don't think, would come as a revelation to anyone, but businesses want and need to make money. So I'm wondering, in what ways do you see businesses adopting the neurodiversity approach as a way to increase their revenue? multiple ways you can do it. I mean, if you look at, uh, at SEO, because we, what we do, we do a lot of market research and neurodiversity training and related workshops, services and systems are very much in demand. I mean, all you need to do is look at the various amazing global bodies that have launched in the last even 12 months where you have things like the Institute of Neurodiversity, which is, going to, which is global, uh, which I, I was part of the Global Steering Committee for and even neurodiversity in business. Now, that's mostly, based, that's in the UK, kind of only, the UK and Ireland. But, I mean, neurodiversity is something that people are listening to, that people want, and are ready to pay for it. So, we have done a couple of rebrands for a couple of uh, projects, you know, to the kind of neurodiversity kind of ideology, because it's what people want. It's what the majority of the community support. And whenever that happens... I mean, we do find that people can sell more memberships, people can sell more courses, can become more in demand, and in some cases, their stock price can go up, investment opportunities can massively go up, and even mergers, acquisitions, and company value can all go through the roof as well. So to me, there seems to be more and more businesses that, there's, that are saying they're taking a neurodiversity approach but from the outside, I'm a little bit skeptical based on their marketing 
as it seems like they do they really truly understand <laughs> this approach. So what are some ways to know if you're truly dealing with maybe a nonprofit or a for-profit business that truly understands um, this approach? Oh yeah, well we, we, like I see it all the time, people think that they bolt neurodiversity onto something that everybody <laughs> will just flock to them. It doesn't really work that way because I'm sure you know, Doug, one of the sexiest marketing words in the world people view is neurodiversity, but it's so much more than that. It's more than just a marketing word. It's more than just a nice kind of concept to put in your advertising and a bit to get more people in because you can see very quickly the people that have taken this approach. Oh, let's just scribble out autism and just put neurodiversity there in particular ones that say we offer neurodiversity affirming ABA or we are a neurodiversity charity for people with autism and then you see like neurodiversity like bolted into the inside of a puzzle piece and it just does not work if anything it is an active repellent and basically what we do is for any kind of companies that have started to try this themselves where it's, it's, it's getting the neurodiversity ideology kind of through the fabric of the business itself. So then it's outward messaging will also contain that. So you can't really have one without the other. And, and so many people, um, you know, you were talking a little bit earlier about starting out as a social worker. You started as a social worker and then you ended up shifting to another career. And that could be based on so many different factors for folks. So... So I'm, I'm wondering, what was that transition for you like, um, moving from a social worker to now like the CEO of a company? It was very natural. It just sort of happened where whenever my first book came out, I mean, I did have business interests and investments and stuff. And I started speaking, ended up giving two TED Talks, which is, it was just a whirlwind. It was a whirlwind of a time. And... It just sort of happened where for me, it was a transition that happened to me more than I made happen. But there was a lot of action that I did have to take. It was, it was hard to get used to at the start where being a social worker was everything I'd ever known. It was my nine to five for so many years. You know, I had an office, I had colleagues and going from that to this kind of full time, because I mean, even though, like, on paper, like, the NTI as it is now is two years old, it's actually older, like, in, in real life, where it had, like, a couple of, like, it was part-time, a bit of a side hustle, a bit of a project, and then it just sort of evolved and, and took on a life of its own. And, I mean, it was hard at times where, I'm not going to say I missed my old career. I mean, I missed some of the people, but... I always think life's too short to be doing something that you don't love. And I suppose I fell out of love with it. And in the bits and pieces that I was doing, whether it was online seminars or doing talks in hotels for parents, getting some stories across, having some laughs, signing some books, I thought I was having more impact doing that because I'm very much an impact guy. And it gets quite addictive. If you have a good impact and people resonate with your message, then it can go from strength to strength. And that's exactly what's happened. And like that's what I would say to everybody. Everybody listening to this is that, you know, because a lot of people that come through the NTI door, because like, this is a kind of typical kind of scenario where people would say to me, oh, I would love to get into coaching or advocacy or mentoring or set up a training business or whatever. And I'm like, go for it. If that's your passion and that's your interest, and that's the path of life that you want to follow, then absolutely. And we've seen a couple like scale and grow all over the world, which has been wonderful. And it's been lovely to be there with the moment. So yeah, that's that's what the, the, the transition can be like. It can be it can be scary, but I promise it's worth it. Now you just kind of mentioned that something that I think is so true, and I can certainly relate to it, is that impact is addictive. I'm curious, do you have any advice on how to not kind of go into burnout when you know you, you kind of have that momentum going you know you're, you're making an impact um you, you're making a difference it's feeling really good but then one day you're like uh-oh uh, i think 
for me, I'm, we were just talking about this before we came on, is that, you know, from pretty much not this May, but from next May onward, is that I'm taking all of May off all the time, forever, for, for as long as I'm lucky enough to have air in my lungs, where I always say at least once a month, have time to yourself. And that's completely by yourself to rejuvenate, whether that's like having a spa day, going to a hotel on your own, where I very much like my own company, where I like I like speaking to people, I like meeting with people, but I like to have like a non-people day where I have no phone, I have no humans around me whatsoever, and I just get to enjoy my own company for an entire day where it's so simple to do. And I think it's something that if you develop it, the healthy habit of taking breaks and setting a limit of what you're going to do in a week, where I would say, I say to everyone, because most people that come my way, they're working 80 hours a week, uh, sometimes more. Um, I always say, have a healthy number of hours that you work every week. Because for me personally, I work 30 hours in a week because I'm comfortable with that. I'm not somebody that's going to be like, oh, I'll work one hour a week and whatever. I, I think people in the sector should work kind of in their business too as well because I know the trendy thing on LinkedIn is work on your business, not on your business. But I like working in it and I think to have a, a relatable brand, you have to stay in it. Mm-hmm. But set, set boundaries where you have a people-free day once a month and you work a healthy amount of hours per week, which I would say will be 40 hours or less, and you stick to it. Absolutely. Now, coming up, you're going to be a keynote speaker for an event called uh, New York City Autism Tech Innovation and Career Expo. What What's kind of the mission of this event? The mission of this event is to bring kind of alternative supports for autistic people and families to front and center, where we all know the horrible pharmaceutical options, you know, that are out there in the world. And a lot of people do not want these options, they don't support them, and can often lead to expensive insurance claims and all of these horrible things that are associated with access to supports, where what we want to achieve in the future, you know, with the expo, and what their ultimate goal is, is to create an ecosystem of kind of neurodiversity affirming and serving projects, services, supports, for those who really need them and can access them quickly at a much more reasonable cost than maybe the more mainstream ones. So, I mean, because I'm one of these people where I'm not naive. I know there are people out there that need a lot more support than I will ever need. And I mean, there are people out there that need less support than what I need. And I think it's good to have everything under one roof where people can access these things, people can talk and meet and Likewise, for the kind of businesses and even non-profits uh, that will be exhibiting and uh, kind of showing their presence at the event, like an ecosystem where there can be collaboration, where there can be growth together, and I suppose really making a lasting impact. That's the whole goal of it. It's a whole day, and it's on uh, May 7th at the High School of Art and Design, so we couldn't have had a better venue for it. The High School of Art and Design have been fantastic so far. They have great exhibitor space, a big fancy auditorium, and there's some great speakers going turning up as well, uh, which we're um, kind of giving as much variety as possible to the whole day. So I suppose that's the expo, and it's kind of a hybrid event where it's in person and virtually as well. So at the virtual kind of end of it is being looked after by Brian Wesley Johnson of Solidity Magazine on the Aspire platform. So that's pretty much the event in the nutshell, and it's free, and it's free to attend which is great because we want to show as many people as possible kind of positive alternatives to perhaps the more negative kind of forceful ones that are out there. Now, I'm sure you could talk about a lot of different things, but um, what are you going to be specifically talking about in your keynote and what do you hope people leave saying after um, hearing you talk? For me specifically, I want to stress the importance of togetherness where we have had the worst kind of two years imaginable because of COVID and restrictions and stay-at-home orders and lockdowns and everything else. And I think it's about building back and building back together, where, I mean, 
as far as tech and innovation, some of the most innovative people ever to have lived have been neurodivergent. And it's true. Like, I mean, the most commonly cited example is Einstein, where, can you imagine, and I say this every single interview, every single interview, and I will keep saying it because it's so true, and I humble <laughs> is if Einstein was born today at the time and date of this recording, right? We probably wouldn't have special and general relativity because somebody would probably say, no, no, little Albert, you need to stop obsessing about space and time and the nature of reality and everything else. Where even back over a hundred years ago, because there was no stigma attached to being autistic because it wasn't in the mainstream consciousness, he was able to achieve wonderful things, as have many other neurodivergent people. And it's about having a whole mindset shift to allow innovation to take center stage rather than stigma. That's the whole purpose of my keynote. I hope I haven't spoiled it. Please don't come to the expo because there's more to it than that. <laughs> I'm sure there's going to be way more to it than that. Um, so people should definitely go. So I know you get a lot of opportunities to speak at events and conferences. Why did you decide to say yes to this opportunity? Because I get a lot of requests for stuff and I like to speak at things that I'm aligned to and people that I like where I would encourage everybody to be in a position of work with people that you like, that you align with. Um, I, got, I got speaking to Richard Schreiber and Richard Schreiber is a force of nature, a born New Yorker, and we got on like a house on fire. And I really believe in his mission. I believe in what the New York City Austin community group are doing by putting this all together. And that's why I went for it, where it was just like, wow, where as far as innovation, if you think about it, like autistic people have been at the head of innovation probably forever. I would say it's probably the neurodivergent architect that designed the Great Pyramid of Giza. And it's about celebrating that. It's about putting that front and center because we all know, and this is a kind of blueprint for most conferences, where a lot of them can be sob stories. Look how terrible my circumstances are. Look how horrible pe horribly people have treated me. And this isn't the flavor of this expo. It's let's celebrate the people that are innovative, that want to make a change and let's celebrate it, nurture it and support them as individuals as much as we can to make sure that they have a lasting impact on the legacy. And that's the book. And how can people learn a little bit more about the New York City Autism Tech Innovation and Career Expo and hopefully purchase tickets? Absolutely. And you know what? There's absolutely no purchase necessary. You just register because it's absolutely free. And it's on Eventbrite under NYC Autism Tech Innovation and Careers Expo. There's also a link on the site nycautismcommunitygroup.org. Um, there's a lot of kind of traction on social media and LinkedIn. I mean, basically, if you Google NYC Autism Tech Expo, you will find it. It's very easy to find. And um, if you can't find it, then all you can do is let me know, and I will happily point you in the right direction. And all the kind of speakers and exhibitors and everything are outlined. And you can go and see them because it promises to be a phenomenal event. Well, Jude, I always enjoy our conversations and no, felt no different today. Thanks so much for joining me, and I look forward to the next time we speak. Absolutely. Keep in touch. And thank you so much for having me on. Thank you so much to Jude for the conversation. To learn more about Jude and the New York City Autism Tech Innovation and Career Expo, Check out the link in the podcast description for this episode. If you have any interest in learning more about how Autism Personal Coach can help you to get your needs met and desires fulfilled, then book a free call with me today. A link for that uh, call can be found in the podcast description of this episode as well. So I really hope you enjoyed this episode of Autism Stories, and if you did, if you could tell a friend, foe, or anyone you know about it so they could have the same enjoyable experience as you when listening to Autism Stories, it'd be very much appreciated. Till next time, I'm Doug Bletcher of Autism Personal Coach. Talk to you then.